Well, good morning, Anchor Church. Great to see you here today. My name is Matt, lead pastor here at Anchor. If I've not met you before, I would love to do so this morning. I'm really excited about this three-week series that we've got coming up called Wayward because uh, this has been such a big part of my story. And so this morning, what I wanted to do is start by sharing a little of my journey, of my testimony, my faith. I was brought up in a Christian home. Uh, My mum and dad loved Jesus, and we moved to Australia and joined a church in the Hills District, and I went to church, and I was one of those kids that sat in Sunday school and knew all of the answers to all of the questions, and the kid at youth group who, when their youth leader was a new Christian, still trying to figure out what it looked like, just schooled my youth group leaders in the Bible and just knew everything, but I had this disconnect between what was existing in my head and my heart. The truth that I perhaps believed up here didn't trickle down and affect any other aspect of my life. And, and so what I ended up doing was living a double life. On one hand, pretending to be a Christian on Sundays and perhaps Friday night at youth group, but really for the rest of the week just partying, living it up. And um, I remember feeling this deep sense of disconnect between what I professed to believe with my lips, but the way that my life was actually playing out. I ended up feeling disillusioned and lost. I ended up feeling guilty. I ended up feeling condemned. And my story was one of substance abuse, of um, really seeking acceptance from people, of uh, particularly unhealthy relationship and really of running as far and as hard as I could from God. And I remember, um, for me, the thing that was probably most profound and real was this desire to be accepted. I'd moved six different primary schools in five years and uh, hadn't had a friend for more than 12 months. And when I started high school, I was desperate to be accepted. I was willing to do anything to be accepted by the guys that I thought were cool and would like me and accept me and make me feel like I meant something, make me feel like I was worth something. And so I fell into a group of guys who partied and took drugs and experimented and really lived this double life for quite some time, partying on Saturday and then going to church on Sunday. And that experience has left me with a a burden, a heart for people who have experienced something similar, perhaps have grown up in church, have grown up around the things of God. Maybe your parents went to church, but for whatever reason, you decided to drift away, walk away, or like me, run away from God as far as you could and as hard as you could. And I think if I reflect honestly, I I probably believed that God was a God of mercy, that God was forgiving, that God sent Jesus to die for my sins, but I just didn't really believe that he was a master worth following. Didn't really believe that Jesus was worth giving my life for, giving my life over to. Wasn't really convinced that the acceptance of a church community and more so the acceptance of a heavenly father was what my soul really desired. I was searching for those things in all of these other relationships that I had around me. And I ran from God. I ran hard. And so I've got a particular burden and heart for prodigals, for the wayward, for the spiritual battlers. I think I've done 17 years of youth ministry before planting Anchor Church and seen countless young people come up through youth ministry. And by the way, I too am really excited about this youth ministry that we're going to be starting in uh, next week. But I've seen so many young people come up through youth ministry professing the things of God only to walk away from the church for a whole plethora of reasons. So God has given me a real burden and a heart for those who find themselves wayward and lost and wandering and far from God. And maybe that's you here today. Maybe that's your story. You have not set foot into a church for quite some time. And I want to thank you this morning for taking a risk on us, for being here. 
Because I acknowledge that that's a big step. It's not easy to come back to church if you've been away for some time. Or perhaps you're watching online as we've recorded these. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. Please watch longer than the 60 second snap bite that you normally would watch anything online. Stick with us. My hope is that all of us would stick through this three week series and at the the driving motivation for this series. My heart for this is that every single person would know and more than know would encounter God's love for them. Nothing more, nothing less. My hope is that you will walk away from this knowing that God loves you. No matter who you are, no matter how far you've gone, no matter how far you've been away, how long you've been away, that God loves you. And so please stick with us. But there's a whole bunch of reasons, isn't there, why people walk away from church and perhaps walk away from God. Maybe for you, that's you just found the church wasn't relevant. Your experience of church was that the message that was preached and the world that you lived in had no overlap. It was entirely irrelevant for your life. Maybe you've been hurt by someone in church. Perhaps you've been burnt by a church leader spiritually abused and honestly the amount of people that that's your story here this morning i know i've heard your stories and i want to apologize if that's you if you've been hurt by someone who ought to have cared for you and loved you and nurtured your faith and instead destroyed it i know i didn't do that to you but but we are truly sorry that that has been your experience Or perhaps you've been hurt by not a church leader, but just someone in the church. God's people who should have been better, but maybe were judgmental, maybe in a time of need, didn't offer grace and hope, but offered judgment and condemnation. Maybe you've been living a life that's full of compromise. The decisions that you've made have been at odds with what the church taught, what you read in your Bible. And you've made compromise after compromise and sooner or later you find yourself standing a very long way from God. Maybe you couldn't find a husband or a wife at church and so you went outside to begin to look for someone that you could spend the rest of your life with. Maybe you just found what the world has to offer far more appealing than anything you read in your Bible. Maybe your experience of church was that it was just stifling rules-based, legalistic, harsh. And that was at odds with what you read of the life and person of Jesus. Maybe your experience of God was that something happened in your life that caused deep hurt and pain and you felt alone and you're still angry at God for that. You're carrying a sense of bitterness towards God. Or maybe for you it's just been mental health. Maybe it's been hard to get to church. Maybe it's been hard to be in Christian community. Social anxiety, depression. You feel like you've got to go to church and and pretend that everything's okay because it seems like everyone else's life is good and sweet and normal. They've got it all together, but you are dying on the inside. Maybe that's been your experience. Or maybe you don't even know why. Maybe you've just drifted. Or perhaps you're one of the many statistics in church life. That at some significant point of transition in your story, be that moving from high school to university, or be that moving from university to full-time employment, those significant changes in your life, just for whatever reason, that was so big for you, you just forgot about church, you forgot about God's people, and you've drifted. Whatever your story is, You find yourself far from God, far from God's people, questioning whether or not God actually still cares or loves you. Over the next couple of weeks, my aim is that you would see unmistakably, categorically, that God is committed to you, that He does love you, that His heart, in fact, is filled with compassion towards you. Today we're going to look at the most famous wayward story ever, the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. It's a story that James 
read for us. But before we dive into it, I'm going to pray for us again. So please join me as I pray. Father God, there are so many people in this room this morning, and I thank you that you know every single person. I think you know every single person watching online. You know our stories. You know us intimately. You know our objections. You know our hurts, our pain. I pray now, God, that you would meet us in your word. That you would help us not just know that you love us, but experience your love for us. God, this story may be so familiar. But I pray for fresh eyes this morning to see your character, to see your worth, to see your love for us. And God, I I need this truth this morning because I find it hard to believe that you would see the darkness of my soul and love me still. And so, Father God, I pray that you would wash over us by your spirit this morning and give us a fresh encounter with your love. Overwhelm us, God. I prayed in the powerful name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. I don't know if you've ever lost anything that has been of great value to you. Perhaps you've lost your credit card. I thought I lost my credit card just this week on Friday. I thought I dropped it on King Street. You drop your credit card on King Street, you've got no idea what's going to turn up on your credit card bill. Two puppies, a bottle of whiskey, and well, you know whatever else. I hadn't lost it. I just put it in the wrong pocket in my wallet, thankfully. But for many years, I lost my wedding ring. In fact, I've lost it twice, and this isn't the one that I originally bought. The first time I lost my wedding ring, and just so you know, like the wedding ring's kind of significant if you've not been married. It's the thing that you say your vows, you exchange a ring with your spouse, and you say, this is a symbol of my love, of my commitment, and of my vows to you, and I lost it. Because what would happen was, I hated wearing rings. And so my hands would get claustrophobic and I'd take them off. Everywhere I arrived at wallet, keys, phones, sunnies, rings, take them off and put them down. And I was constantly losing my ring and my wedding ring. And Tash would say to me, you're going to lose that properly one day, you know. And one day I did. I lost my wedding ring, couldn't find it. And I remember praying this prayer to God, saying, God, if you would let me find this ring, I promise you I will take better care of it next time. And literally that week, my mother-in-law found my wedding ring in the lip of her washing machine. And I was like rejoicing. I was like, thank you, God. I found my ring. I promise I'm going to take better care of it. Fast forward like six years, a couple of kids later, I've lost the ring again. And flying out to do some um, church planning stuff, I had to buy this ring at the airport because I didn't want to fly out and not have my symbol of my covenant vows to my wife on my hand. But maybe you've lost something valuable to you and, and you were searching for it. You were looking for it. You wanted to find it. It meant something to you. Perhaps that thing's not an inanimate object that has some significance, but it's really still just gold or in this case, silver. Perhaps you've lost a relationship, a person. I remember reading the story of a missing person report of a young girl named Rista who grew up in the southwest of Sydney and on the 24th of March 2006, 2009, sorry, disappeared. I haven't seen her since. I just literally Googled this morning and it seems like they still haven't found her. You imagine what it's like for her family, her mum and her dad, who've got no idea where their little girl is. She was 16 years old at the time when she disappeared. Imagine if she came home. Imagine that moment for her parents as she walked through the front door and they laid eyes on their daughter that they have not seen for close to 10 years. Well, friends, that is the experience of a father in this story that James read for us earlier. A father who had two sons and one of those sons goes missing. That father thinks that his son is as good as dead, has been lost. And we see a beautiful story that illustrates the heart of God. So let's pick up the story in chapter 15, verse 11. This is the request that the younger son makes of his father. Verse 11. And he said to him, that's Jesus speaking, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, 
Give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Now, you've got to understand, this is an outrageous request at the best of times. Because generally, inheritance comes when someone has died and passed away. And so for this younger son to request his inheritance while his father is still alive is outrageous. It's offensive. That would be offensive now in 2018 if any of you said to your parents, Mum, Dad, I was just thinking Sydney housing property prices are pretty significant. If you could just you know, speed up the process of... And um, what this son is effectively saying to his dad is, I wish you were dead so I could get your stuff. Now, put that story in the context of Middle Eastern culture, a culture that had shame, honor elements to it, a culture where the, the, the patriarch of a family was viewed with honor and respect. This request from the youngest son is outrageous. It's offensive. I wish you were dead. Effectively, he says, Dad, give me all of my money. I'm moving to Nimbin and I'm going to party. I'm going to waste all of the inheritance. But you know what's more reckless and outrageous than this younger son's request of his dad is actually the father's generosity. You see, for this wealthy, distinguished gentleman, all of his wealth would have been tied up with property. He would have had to have made a very public sale of property and given his younger son his share of the inheritance. That is reckless. It's almost wasteful. He knows what this younger son's going to do. And yet he still divides the inheritance and gives it to him. Outrageously wasteful prodigal. The real prodigal in this story is God is the father. This younger son gets together all that he has and he heads off to a distant country and there he parties. He lives wildly, it says there. We know that uh, from the older brother's response that news has trickled back that the younger son has been wasting the family inheritance on prostitutes. He's been paying for the intimacy that he couldn't get. Parting, spending, he hasn't figured out the simple equation that if there's no money coming in and you continue to spend, sooner or later it's going to run out. Not only does his run money run out, the place that he is living is hit with a severe famine. He's got nothing left. So he hires himself out to someone of that country to feed pigs. And for a young Jewish man, that is the, literally the bottom of the bottom. An animal that they considered unclean, not worthy of eating, and here he is feeding pigs, and the pigs are better fed than himself. He can't even kill a pig and eat a pork chop or a bacon rind because he's a Jewish boy. He hits rock bottom. And in this moment, he comes to his senses, and he begins to plan out a return trip to his father. Have a look at what he says in verse 17. But when the younger son came to himself, he said... How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I know. I, I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. He begins to get together this little prepared speech, this little spiel for his dad. And his hope is that he would go back and, and not be welcomed back into the family like a son. He had forfeited that right. He had squandered the inheritance. He had wasted the father's property. And so his plan was to go back and say, Dad, would you please make me not like a servant, the servant lived with the family. The hired man was the one who came in and out every day, had less provisions than the servants, the slaves that lived with the, the household. Make me like one of the day workers. His plan is, I'm going to work back this debt that I owe to my father. And perhaps if I work this back, then maybe my father will accept me. And so he gets this little spiel together his prepared speech and he begins to head off home. When I was 
uh, in the school holidays between year eight and year nine, I think I was about 14 years old, my parents were out at Symphony in the Domain and I had a few friends around and we decided it would be a good idea to make a bit of rocket fuel, which was literally just take all of the alcohol from your parents' liquor cabinet, top it all up so that they didn't know that there was much off the top and drink it. And then in all of our drunken wisdom to take my mum's work car for a drive. And you got to understand, my mum worked for a company that made her record every single meter she drove in that car. She had a logbook, she wrote it all down, and I had no idea what I was thinking, that she would get in and notice a couple of, you know, 10 extra Ks on the car. Where did that come from? But clearly, I wasn't thinking straight. We drove this car, we did laps around the block, one corner from my house. One corner, I was turning around the corner, mistook the brake for the accelerator, launched up the curb into a tree, crashed that car, and rode it off. My two best mates were in the car. They bailed according to plan. They ran. I was stuck in the car and a neighbor came rushing out and yanked the door open and grabbed me and shook me and yelled at me and sat me down on the curb while we waited for the police to arrive. And they came and they breathalyzed me and lectured me. They towed the car away and they sent me home to wait for my parents. And the only thing left was a red bumper bar from a little 1999 Ford Laser that I took and I carried with me. And I waited at home with a bumper bar in the living room for my mum and dad to get home from Symphony and Domain. Now, I don't know if you've ever found yourself in one of those moments, but I've got to tell you, my stomach was churning inside of me. What would my parents say when they got home? What would they do? What would they, th- what would they think of me? W- what's going to happen when the police come back? I'm in so much trouble. I can identify with the younger son in this story. That moment where you feel sick to the core of your stomach because of something you have done and you are waiting for the reaction. What what do you think this younger son was expecting when he went home to his dad, his family, the family estate, after squandering everything that they had? What, What reaction do you expect from a Middle Eastern patriarchal family? This is what happens. Verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy. He called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The father in this story is standing on the front porch of his house and he's looking out at the horizon and he sees a speck emerge. He sees a silhouette emerging over the horizon and he recognizes it. He recognizes that walk and he thinks to himself, that's my boy. That's my son. And so he runs off the steps, down the path, down the road. He runs, he literally gathers up the hem of his robe and he runs to meet his son. Then you've got to understand in the first century that he's so undignified. Here is a wealthy, distinguished man. The Romans ran. The Romans in the Olympic Games, they ran. They got medals and trophies for that. Jewish men did not run. Culturally inappropriate, but so bursting with joy is this father that he doesn't care how undignified it looks. He picks his robe up and he runs to his boy. And he gets there and he hugs his son. And he kisses his son. You know that moment when two men hug, the bro hug? 
Anyone familiar with that kind of hug? It's kind of like this, you know, like one arm around the back, sort of semi-handshake, kind of like pat on the back, yeah, mate, yeah, mate. Like, that's not the type of hug that we see happening here. This is the type of hug, literally, if you read some older versions of the Bible, it says, and he fell on his neck. The father, literally, he snuggles into the son's neck and he kisses him. In fact, it says that he couldn't stop kissing him. He's so overjoyed to see his boy back. And then he says to his servants, you notice he calls the servants the the thing that the son wanted to be. He says, quick, bring a ring. Potentially, this is the father's own family ring that he would seal things with and stamp things with. He says, bring the ring, put it on his finger. Get my robe, a clean robe. Put a clean robe on this son of mine. Put sandals on his feet. All of these are symbols of sonship, of acceptance. The father is saying, this boy is not coming back to my family as a hired hand, as a servant. He's coming back in as a son. And I'm covering him with my robe. I'm giving him my ring. I'm welcoming him back. And then he says, Let's party. And you would have thought at that moment, the younger brother would have gone, I thought I'd partied enough. More partying? The partying was the problem to begin with. And the father comes home. He comes home and the father throws a party. He says, get the best cut of meat you can possibly find. The fattened calf. The calf that was reserved for special celebrations. You bring the fattened calf, the special one. Let's kill that, that, let's kill that animal and cook it and celebrate and have a feast. Why? This son of mine was lost and is found. He was dead. I have him back alive. I need you to know this morning... Friends, that that is God's disposition towards you. The father in this story is a picture of God. That experience that the father has of a heart that explodes with compassion, of undignified love that embraces, is how God feels towards anyone who comes home. That's how God feels about you. But our problem is, more often than not, we think, well, I've got to fix myself up. I've got to sort this mess in my life out before I could ever go back to church or before I could ever pray or before I could ever read my Bible. I've got I've to sort the junk out in my life and then perhaps God would accept me. But what I want you to notice here is the timing of this heart of compassion. When, when does the father's heart erupt with compassion? Is it after the son confesses, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you? No, it's not. It's before. The father sees his son and before any skerrick of repentance or remorse rolls off the son's tongue, the father's heart erupts with compassion and love and mercy and forgiveness. God loves you. To quote my good friend and author Alex Early in his book Reckless Love of God, he says, God is not hiring employees. He's adopting sons and daughters. The father here is not interested in hiring his son as a hired hand. He's interested in welcoming him back into the family as his precious child. God is not interested in your work, your effort, your behavior modification plan. He's interested in you. He loves you. He has compassion on you. You My favorite part of this story is verse 20. He felt compassion. He he felt compassion. That's how God feels towards you. He feels compassion. 
If you've ever wondered how God would respond if you came back with your mess, your brokenness, your 10 years away from the church, if you've ever wondered how God's going to respond, this is how he responds. With mercy, with forgiveness, with grace, with love, with joy, with parting and celebration. You have not out God's grace. You are not too far gone. It has not been too long. The grace of God is gavenously deep. It is inexhaustible. It does not run out. It cannot run dry. God is for you and he loves you. In fact, he's actually been looking for you, waiting for you, longing that you would come back. doesn't matter how long you've been gone. It doesn't matter how long your list of mistakes is. God loves you. His heart is filled with compassion. And he has been looking. We know that because Jesus actually tells two additional stories to the story of the lost son. He tells a story of a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and he loses one of those sheep And the shepherd leaves the 99, which seems careless, and he goes in pursuit of the one. He looks for the one. Or the second story he tells is of a woman who has 10 coins, equivalent of a a, a day's wage each coin, and she loses one. And she sweeps the house and lights a lamp and searches for that one lost coin. Jesus' unmistakable point here is that God is searching for those who are lost. God is looking for those who are wayward. God longs for the prodigal to come home. We might think to ourselves, it's just one sheep. I mean, the wayward sheep is dumb. It got lost, big deal, whatever. It's one sheep. You've still got 99. God doesn't operate like that. He searches for. He looks for. He's waiting for the one. Because the one matters. And maybe that one is you today. God loves you. His heart is filled with compassion for you. He's waiting for you to come home. And it's interesting that Jesus tells this story to a very particular audience and context. In chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, it says this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, that is Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. You've got to understand in the, in the Bible, the, tax, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they're the religious people, they're the church types. And they are grumbling that the company that Jesus keeps is inappropriate. The church guys who are blogging and Facebook ranting and complaining. And and Jesus tells this story in the context of this audience. The church people, the religious types. Because what was happening is, as Jesus preached the message of the good news of the kingdom, the tax collectors, the prostitutes and the sinners were all drawn to him. In fact, Matthew says that they're getting into the kingdom of heaven ahead of the religious people. And so Jesus tells this story to clearly communicate something to two audiences. To the church audience, to the religious audience, he says, you need to understand God's heart for people. God is willing to come and get his hands dirty and messy in people's lives. That's why he sends Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, born of a virgin born as a human, as a baby, in the brokenness and mess of this world. You've got to understand that God cares for, He is searching for, He is pursuing them. In fact, the picture of the older brother in this story, the, the, the part of the story we're not going to focus on this morning, is a picture of the religious people, and Jesus offers an invitation for them as well to come, to experience the Father's kindness, to experience the Father's grace. In fact, both of these younger brother, these brothers, they're both lost. One is lost in his rebellion, the other is lost in his religion. 
You see, there are two ways of running from God, two ways to be lost. Some people reject God with cocaine and parties, and other people reject God with church and prayers. Both of them, both of those ways can be an entire rejection of a relationship with God and saying, I just want the blessings that you can give me. I'm not really interested in a relationship. Jesus' invitation is everyone can experience God's grace, his heart of compassion. But he tells this story to this audience because he wants the religious people to know God's heart. But the sinners and the prostitutes and the tax collectors, they're also there. They're also hearing the story. Jesus wants them to know this is how God feels towards you. He loves you. He's compassionate. It doesn't matter really where you are this morning. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. It doesn't matter how long you've been away. It doesn't matter what you've done. For every single person who comes home, there are the open, open arms, wide open arms of a God who wants to embrace you and forgive you and start again. And my hope this morning is that you would get just a small window into the inexhaustible grace and mercy that God has for us, that God has for you. Let me pray together. Let me pray for us that we would capture this, that we would understand this. God, this morning as we pause and think on your heart, it almost seems too good to be true. God, it feels like we've been children who've refused to eat our dinner, but we get dessert anyway. It just doesn't seem like it's fair, but yet we know that Christ Jesus died in our place and for our sin. He took all of our rebellion, our rejection upon himself and died for us. That you would look upon us and not scold and not be angry and not seek to punish because that has been done. But that you would look upon us with compassion like a sheep that is lost. Seems too good to be true, God, and yet we know that there is no other way. We cannot make ourselves acceptable. You didn't need us, but you wanted us. I pray for every single person who has heard this message this morning that all of us would know that you love us and more than that, that we would encounter and experience your love again. Please do your work. We ask by the power of your spirit. We pray it in Jesus' strong name. Amen.